Welcome to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's guest is Stacy Cunningham, president of the New York Stock Exchange. Good morning, everyone. This is Jennifer Hawksbland, the CEO at New York Bio. We are thrilled to have the New York Stock Exchange president, Stacy Cunningham, as our guest today on our virtual breakfast series. As you all know, we've been doing these since early April, and we've had a whole variety of guests all across the spectrum of um, key stakeholders to important biotech um, industries and companies, and none more important than the public markets. That's um, everyone's goal, right, is to be able to have a company that is viable and producing uh, therapies for patients and hopefully goes to the public markets to access their, um, their capital. So today we want to thank our sponsor, the law firm Goodwin Proctor has sponsored our series for the month of July. And so we're really thankful to them for doing that. Um, we wanna turn, I'm gonna turn it over to Derek to introduce Stacy, and then we'll get going in our usual sense. One, one reminder for you all, as always, there is a Q and A box as well as a chat box. So if you have questions for Stacy throughout our discussion, feel free to throw them up there and Derek and I will moderate them um, to her. Derek? All right, thank you. So Stacy, good morning. It's really great to have you with us this morning. Uh, we don't always start with this, but first and foremost, how are the markets doing this morning? <laughs> <laughs> you know, every day, every day is a surprise. <laughs> I think everybody everybody tends to tends to look and, and uses that as a little bit of a barometer to think about how things are going, uh, and we'll we'll get into more of that. But we tend to start these things with a little bit of an origin story. And when, you know, we start with with biotech folks, usually it's this is how I got into science and this is how I got into this this part of my career. But uh, you're definitely a little bit different from everybody else we've, we've got here. So tell us kind of how you got to where you were. So where, do, where did you come from and how did you, how did you end up as the president of the New York Stock Exchange? You know, I wish it were a, a more interesting story, but it's really, it was a very unintentional story. I, I was studying engineering and the, the real fact of it is I, when I was in college and, and trying to get a summer job, I was actually trying to get a job just waitressing at a local restaurant and no one would hire me because I didn't have waitressing experience. And so I would just kept going around and I thought like, I'd be a really good waitress. I don't know why they didn't bring me on, but they wouldn't take a chance. And so it was somewhat, uh, you know, I, I ended up having a conversation and, and my father was in the industry and he said, well, I know somebody's looking for summer interns, maybe you can get an internship. So I ended up with an internship on the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange, but I always loved math and science. And so I, I really thought that would be the path that I would take. And when I ended up on the trading floor, it was just a few minutes before I realized I, I have real passion for the, for the financial markets and I, I was surprised by it. So it, it took me about 15 minutes to decide that that was gonna be the path I, I wanted to follow. And it, I was lucky that I found something I loved in, in that way. So I went back to school and I finished my degree and I started full time on the trading floor. So I didn't work for the New York Stock Exchange itself. I worked mm -hmm. for a trading firm that uh, it was at the time known as specialists. Now they're known as designated market makers. And they're the people on the trading floor that are responsible for overseeing trading in the stocks that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So that was my job. I did that for about 10 years. And, and then I, I ultimately left the floor. And, and there are a number of reasons why. It was really about the path to technology integration and, and, and how things were, were moving. And frankly, I thought it was too slow at the time. And so I, I left and I spent some time at NASDAQ was there for about six years until I came back and I decided to take a job at the New York Stock Exchange, which was a place, you know, I grew up at the NYC. And so I really, really loved it. And they reached out and said, you know, we're, we're reinventing this place and, and can, can you come in and, and join? 10 days later, it got announced that we were being acquired 10 days after I joined, which, you know, you can't predict <laughs> these yeah. things. And at the time it was disappointing. And I thought, why well, nobody could give me a heads up before I quit my job that that this was happening, but with change comes opportunity. And it was a really great opportunity for me to be part of a team that, that was completely rethinking how the exchange operated. And so I became the COO and then I took over as president just over two years ago when my, when my predecessor moved on. What were they trying to do differently? What was, what was kind of the big shift they were trying to enact? You know, it, it's it, it, Intercontinental Exchange is the company that bought NYSE. And mm -hmm. ICE was a 12 year old startup 
buying a 220 year old institution with a very entrepreneurial culture. You know, it was founded by a guy named Jeff Sprecher who just thought the energy markets could be more efficient. He was not an, a markets person. He, he was a chemical engineer who was uh, operating power plants and thought this, this shouldn't work this way. And so he started to, to create uh, an online trading platform in the energy markets, which took off in the post Enron collapse and then continued to, to apply that model to other asset classes. After the financial crisis in 2008, he said, what are these credit default swaps? Literally Googled them to find out what they were <laughs> and said, well, wait a minute, these things seem to be carrying an awful lot of risk. <laughs> it's gonna happen. So yeah. we introduced a clearing platform, platform for credit default swaps. And so when they bought the New York Stock Exchange, it was, hey, we have this really strong brand and, and institution but, but it, it was a not-for-profit for so many years that it really operated almost in a bureaucratic kind of way. And, and so we, we took a step back and thought, what are the things that, that we do really, really well and better than anybody else? And let's invest in those. What are the things that we're doing just because we've been doing them for 200 years and we can stop doing them now? And what are the things that we're not doing that we should be doing? And it, and it allowed us to really think about all, all of those things. And when you look at how we've changed the NYC, we completely renovated or, or rebuilt our technology platform on t the industry best trading platform, which, you know, the NYC just wasn't, wasn't especially known for that. We always used technology, but part of why I left was the technology wasn't really integrated with people. And we believe strongly, very firmly, that the combination of people and technology is so much more powerful than either one on its own but they need to be thoughtfully integrated. And so we continued down that path of really, really combining them in a way so that the technology actually helps people accomplish their jobs and scale up in, in a more effective way. And so that, that was a, a big part of it. And we also looked at the, the, the community of companies that we have, the, the world's greatest community of companies, you know, 2,300 uh, companies that are literally out changing the world every single day. But there are areas where we were underinvested and for some legacy reasons, I mean, people don't always realize but the NYC had listing standards that used to require companies to be profitable before they could become public companies. Which basically rules out any and all biotech. <laughs> yes, it rules out biotech, biotech rules, out a lot of, uh, rules out a lot of the technology companies. And, and that wasn't the way many modern companies that were great solid companies, but just earlier in their life cycle because of their business model that was going to require yep. them to not be profitable. And they still should be able to earn, earn capital. So we modernized our listing standards uh, about 10 years ago that focused on that allowed for companies that weren't yet profitable to to become listed and that that was the, the beginning of the change for you know the, the diversity of companies that we had listed on the nyc and so now since then you know 75 percent of tech proceeds have been raised on nyc but we uh we, we we have some work to do on the biotech front so we made some changes there as well it's well, funny. That's really good and um, go ahead jennifer it's funny that you mentioned credit default swaps i spent a brief stint as a litigator at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And, um, and I can remember sitting on an airplane during the financial crisis, next, having to be sitting next to a congressman on a flight from DC to Atlanta and having to ex literally explain to him what a credit default swap was, and how it, it was not all speculators that had crashed the markets. Right. I wasn't sure if that was a low point or a high point. <laughs> right. We've made some progress. Yes. <laughs> I think so. Well, I think we're going to get to, we'll, we'll definitely get into the, uh, the biotech portion of things, but I wanted to spend a little time talking about how, uh, how the exchange responded to COVID. And from what, from what you had just said, literally, you have to be extremely thankful now that you actually have this exceptionally good trading platform because yes. you only realize how good it is in a crisis, right? If you were, yeah. if, if, th if this had happened uh, a number of years ago, you probably would have been in a much different position. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about how you responded because you had to make some really big moves. You probably had to take some pretty large risks. And from the standpoint of it, considering that, you know, as people open, they look to the markets for where things are going from, from an economic standpoint, it was really, I would say, important, you know, to the country and to the world that you responded in, a, in an efficient and effective manner. Yeah, I, you know, I will say that, that that hits on a number of different levels for, for us. One, it's how did the New York Stock Exchange operate and how did our, our technology operate? But, but importantly, how did the markets operate more broadly? And mm -hmm. you know, it seems like an eternity ago. <laughs> if you go back to early March, which was not that long ago, the markets were dramatically yeah. selling off. It was shocking. It was jarring to investors. 
And we do very a, a very good job as an industry of learning from prior events. And so every time something happens, we we take a step back and we look at it and we say, what did we learn from this? How can we how can we shore up resiliency? And, and always with the goal of of trying to protect investor confidence because that's so critical to the market success is investors having confidence in the market, confidence that they're going to work well, confidence that they're not going to be taken advantage of. They understand hopefully if they're investing that markets don't always go up right that there, there there is some risk in markets going up and down but that they should operate the way they should be and that it should be fair right it should be based on supply and demand and not not based on uh, idiosyncrasies in the market so we, we've done a good job there as you mentioned though we don't get to see the results of our work until the next major event and not every major event is exactly the same it's it's you know like like a storm that comes through and and you you, you fix what you can and you hope it, it's better and uh, in March, we saw the industry really shine with respect to everything we've put in place since the flash crash or the financial crisis or, or prior events. And one of the things that we used, I mean, we used every tool in the toolbox that, that we had. It was, it was literally, you know, if you think about all the protections that we put in place, whether they're protections for market sell-offs, protections for uh, local conditions where people can't get into the office and you have business continuity plans that you need to, to put into effect uh, at a single stock level, at a whole market level. We used every tool in the toolbox. One of the tools that we used, which we haven't used in, in, in modern times, is the market-wide circuit breaker. And what those uh, were designed to do was uh, give a pause to trading in the market so that investors could digest information. Mm -hmm. They themselves were surprising to investor, you know, as a little bit of a shock to see why we're triggering market-wide circuit breakers. They only are triggered at the first time with a 7% move in the market, which is pretty significant. They were designed in 1987, after the crash of 87, mm -hmm. to, to, to be a thoughtful response instead of calls for market closures. So what was funny behind the scenes in March was as we were triggering market-wide circuit breakers and the markets continued each day to sell off, I was getting calls from retail investors, you know, just mom, mom and pop at home in their computers from a, a, a professional investors saying, you need to shut the markets down. You know, we just stop, stop this pain. And we were very firm that that was not on the table. It, you know, I, I spoke to Chairman Clayton at the SEC, Secretary Mnuchin uh, at Treasury, but no one was considering closing the markets and it really, for really important reasons. And the market-wide circuit breakers were, were designed for that purpose. I got a call from the former Treasury Secretary who had designed the market-wide circuit breakers in 1987, Secretary Brady. And he said, listen, I hear all these people saying you should close the markets. You can't do that. <laughs> I was like, we're not doing it. I tell you, we're not doing it. And he's like, the whole reason we put market-wide circuit breakers is, is to stop that. Uh, and there are three, three really important reasons why you wouldn't close the markets. One, you would just be masking the public sentiment you're not actually going to change the conditions, especially considering the reason why the market was selling off. We, we were dealing with a global pandemic that wasn't gonna go away in a couple of days and closing the markets was not gonna change that. It was just gonna hide it. Hiding it has its own downside. Frankly, the, the bipartisan quick action to put a stimulus plan in place was largely driven by the jarring result that people were seeing in the market. And if we didn't see that, I don't think you would have seen politicians coming together so quickly to move and, and, and respond. But third, and I think most importantly, you can't deny people access to the money. And people were now going to be very, very often finding themselves without a job, finding themselves in a position where they needed access to money. So keeping the markets open was really important. And capital raising was critical. And mm -hmm. we raised more capital during the first half of this year, 23% more capital than was raised last year which people don't realize, you know, and, and when I say raise capital, it's, it's not just IPOs, it, it's follow on offerings. Many companies were issuing more shares because they needed more money to, to deal with this and the capital markets were there to provide it. So that's a really critical component of why, why you know, the, the markets really do serve that value and, and they provide a, a revenue source when it's needed. And so to, to, to look at how much was, uh, was raised during that period of time. And then at the NYC, you know, we, we were, we were, proud of the, the work that the markets were doing, but we also had, um, I mean, we were dealing with, with the COVID-19 spreading through, through New York City. And so mm -hmm. it became clear that New York City was, was becoming increasingly, you know, we just didn't know enough about the virus and we, and we weren't sure uh, how quickly it was gonna progress. So 
we started testing and screening at the exchange. And what I, what I, you know, we saw in the first few weeks was we started to see the strain on the healthcare system. Tests weren't available. We do have a business continuity plan, but the fact that the floor is open reduces volatility. And we were in this unprecedented period of volatility. So we really focused mm -hmm. on keeping the floor open, working closely with the governor and, and the government at, at the city, state, and, and local, uh, federal levels, but realized this is going to be too hard to, to maintain until we learn more. So we made the decision to close the trading floor and move to fully electronic trading. Mm -hmm. And again, something that we've tested all the time, we test with the industry, but you never use it live. So I will say that first morning when you're sitting there thinking, you know, I hope this works the way it's supposed to work and the way it always works, but it did. <laughs> so it's a really proud moment for the team because you, you, mm -hmm. you know, you need to put technology in place that can handle anything. You don't know when it's going to come that way. And so we, we used everything we, we've done and, and uh, you know, we processed 330 billion messages one day in March, which is three times. I mean, Google searches are low single digit billion messages around the world <laughs> in a year. So it, a lot. it sounds like a lot. Yeah, it yeah, like it was it was a lot, and, <laughs> and that so it was it was a, a busy period of time, uh, but it all went as as planned. Now, granted, the the market sell off is you know I don't I don't I, I, and certainly I I feel for people who were watching their four hundred one ks decline and hoping yeah. that they didn't react to that moment in time and just you know wait because because that was you know the safer the safer thing to do. Yeah. See, uh, but, how did your designated market makers work uh, virtually? Um, yeah, so, so those, um, those firms are some of the most sophisticated technology firms on Wall Street. And they, they, the way that we've integrated technology with human judgment is algorithmically. So when I was a specialist in trading on the floor, every time that, that there was a trade that was executed, I had a hand in it, actually physically had a hand in it. The way it works today is they're using algorithms to trade. And then they adjust, the human being is just adjusting the algorithms based on conditions. So they can scale that up and scale that back. So they're applying that level of human judgment. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't get, so when we close the trading floor, those firms still have the same obligations that they have. Mm -hmm. They just did so remotely. We never mm -hmm. talked, it was interesting to see, we know stocks trade better on the New York Stock Exchange, but we didn't know uh, how much of our outperformance was tied to the fact that we have market makers that are signed for trading to, to trade securities and how much is the value of human judgment. And this is an experiment I never would have chosen to run, but we actually saw that they both contribute to that separately. So our stocks still traded better than, than, than others, but they didn't trade as well as they do when the floor was open. And part of that is because the humans that are adjusting and, and reacting to what's, what's happening, we lost that piece of it. But they yeah. still have obligations that, that they don't have. And that, that's unique to the NYC. We're, we're the only market that has uh, a specified market maker who has accountability and responsibility for overseeing trading in every stock that's listed here. It's just very different than, than, other, than other models. And they didn't, those obligations didn't go away. So they have to have the best, the best quote in the market. They have to, you know, open and close stocks each day. And, you know, they got the, we, we used even, even there, I mean, I talked about using every tool in the toolbox. One, one day uh, in late March, when President Trump announced at 3.59, the markets closed at four o'clock, at 3.59, that he was gonna have the oil reserves filled, the oil stocks took off, you know, and they just started to run and we're going right into the close. So at four o'clock, nobody else can enter new orders in. And so you don't get the opportunity for sellers to come in and offset that imbalance. Yeah. So we have the ability because we have people involved to apply judgment and say, this doesn't make sense. These stocks, even though they're, they're about to close, they wouldn't close at these prices if people could come in. And so we used one of the tools that we have to delay the closing auction and bring in other sellers to participate. And those, those stocks would have traded at ridiculous prices up three, four, 500% and then come right back down on, on Monday. So, you know, I, we're trying to maintain that investor confidence and, once we had the floor closed, we wouldn't be able to do things like that. Right. And so, yep. um, and so clearly you validated your, right, the NYSE model of yeah. human and- A couple of academics did too. They took the opportunity to, uh, to look at this. There were a couple of studies that came out saying, wow, look at, look at what you see when the, when the floor was closed. So how important was it knowing that you could, if you had to, right, to go, to go virtual, how important was it for you to start reopening the floor? And what, what sort of process did you have to go through for that? 
Yeah, it was important for a number of reasons. One, we wanted to get back to that volatility dampening and, and you know, cost investors millions of dollars a day when the floor was closed because stocks didn't trade quite as well as they had before. So, so providing that full level of service was important. But two, the people on the trading floor don't work for the New York Stock Exchange. And many of them are small businesses. So there are floor brokers on the floor that might have 10 people that work for them and their 100% of their income might be tied to their activity on the trading floor. And so they were like so many other businesses being hurt during that, that period of time. So we wanted to also get them, them back up and running. And we learned a lot over, over the two months that when we were able to reopen. And part of why we closed was because of the strain on the healthcare system, because we didn't know enough about how to protect the, the community but very quickly, we started to gather as much information as we can, share it with those two companies. We brought in uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who is the former commissioner of the FDA, to hold a series of calls with our community to educate what we, uh, on COVID-19. And after, I think, the first call, I said, we, we should hire him to help us put our plan in place. So he's been a consultant for us as we reopened the trading floor and provided a lot of insight. And frankly, we, we reopened at a very small stage and focused mostly on the businesses that were most impacted. So those floor brokers. So our first phase of reopening, we kept the market makers working remotely uh, because they were, they were able to do a lot of what they were doing algorithmically. But the floor brokers who are representing customer orders, uh, we brought them back first. It, it, was, it was a tremendous success. I mean, we've had screening and social distancing and masks and, and a whole new layout walking through so people can get into a cafeteria without without interacting with each other and we worked with cvs who is who is a, a, a listed company of ours on providing screening and, and testing uh at the at the at the door when people come in and we've had no no cases we frankly we expect to have a case yeah but our goal is to prevent an outbreak and and we've had uh, we've been able to scale up we're now at roughly 300 people coming into the trading floor and we've had zero, zero incidents. Everyone's following all of the protocols we put in place. And so we've gotten to a, a space where we can build out. I mean, our, our, our team put a lot of plexiglass around, <laughs> but I think the point is, is you can reopen the economy and you can do things. Yeah. And if you take the time to figure out how to do them, and frankly, the most important part is the mask. And, yeah. and that's not expensive. So even, even smaller businesses could, could do that too. And uh, we, you know, we're focusing on that and we, we've had a lot of success. And I've seen you've been doing, um, have you been doing a combination of virtual and some in-person bell or ringing? Yes, yeah. So we've been working with companies on, on what they prefer, what they're more comfortable to, based on, and well, actually it runs a gamut. Some, some of them who have been, uh, would have to travel to New York, still choosing to do that. And, and ringing the bell. Some are doing a combination of virtual, so they'll have some of their team members on the podium and some of them are, are live streamed in. And it's actually fun. I was surprised to feel the difference when we were up there on the podium by, you know, if I was up there ringing the bell on behalf of a company yeah. and the company is live streamed on the screen behind me, you know they're there and you can turn around and like it feels very different than having a static video up there, which was which was a lot of fun to do. So we've been working with companies in different ways. And, and there are lots of new ideas that keep coming up. So we keep building on that. And it's, it's, it's been fun. I mean, obviously, we look forward to a day when, when we don't have to worry about how many, how many people are, are coming through. And we've designed it in a way so they're not interacting with the trading floor. Okay. So we we'll continue to limit exposure. And, and uh, you know, you're only on the, the podium for, for a few minutes. So depending on how many people and how, how, what their unit is like, they might take a mask off because they, they all are together, you know, very often it's family, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and so that's, uh, that's been, been, it's been fun, but you know, we, we, we improvise during, <laughs> during these periods. Yeah. And I think some of that you'll take, will take away, you know, we hold a series of investor days mm -hmm. uh, and these were live events. And this is one of the, the services that we just provide to our listed companies. If they, come in and they're looking to meet target investors, we'll bring in institutional investors and we'll put up a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings that we help to coordinate uh, in our building on, on site. And obviously we can't do that uh, right now. So we moved those virtual mm -hmm. and we actually had a higher degree of participation from, from companies and investors, you know, folks like Fidelity and others that are outside of New York City and felt like, hey, I can I can virtually attend this. It's much easier. So, you know, coming out of the pandemic, 
I think you'll, you'll see a lot of people and us included using a combination of virtual even when live events are, are accessible again. Yeah, it's been interesting for us even on a small scale, right? So we used to do these breakfasts every other month and we limited it deliberately to 25 to 30 people so mm -hmm. you could have a round table conversation. And clearly like you're in Manhattan, so you could have, you know, we could have hosted you and that would have been fine. But since we started going virtual, we've had guests from multiple guests from Boston, San Francisco, right? Because biotech is across the country. And, um, and it's been really fun to be able to expand our audience and bring the conversations to more people. Right, yeah. And, and, and you start to experiment. So we've done some small scale ones and bigger ones and, and it just opens up the universe and gives you a lot more flexibility in how you structure things. Yeah, well, listen, the, the Scott Gottlieb calls, we were able to be on a couple of them and they were terrific. And I think one of the best things was it was at one of the times where I think the level of uncertainty was the greatest. Yeah. And, you know, literally week to week, you would basically hang your hat on, well, what is happening this week? What do the numbers look like? And, uh, and what is everyone telling us? And, you know, one of really in a five minute stretch, you covered thinking about testing, making sure we wear masks. It's actually really comforting to hear you thinking about these things in a data-driven fashion and kind of following best practices for uh, for safety in terms of how you're thinking of opening up. Um, in doing a bit of homework for this, I actually listened to another one of your your webinars on the, uh, the Influence Makers podcast. And you had a great story about leadership during a crisis being very similar to uh, leadership at a kitchen during a, cri during a crisis, uh, during a crisis in like an actual industrial kitchen. Uh, in terms of communication and everything else, so uh, I couldn't peek, I couldn't picture when from your LinkedIn pro LinkedIn profile you actually went to culinary school, but I figured <laughs> I'd give you the opportunity to throw that one in here. Yeah, I don't I don't remember exactly which story I told, but there are so many similarities between kitchens and and markets. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of funny. When I left the trading floor, I, I left in two thousand five, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do next, so I took a little bit of time off, and I always love food <laughs> and like to eat. So I thought I'll go to culinary school while I figure this out and figure out the next step. And it was never really intended to be a, a career. Uh, although many magazines have, have written that, you know, I, I get made fun of by my colleagues that I'm, um, you know, James Beard award-winning chef and, and <laughs> but I and actually never earned a living in a restaurant. You're gonna but I did go to culinary school. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry? You're gonna cater the ice picnic? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> but you should cook. I'm like, I never earned a living that way, but I love to cook and, I, and, and more importantly, I love to eat. But I went to um, I went to culinary school and went, and part of school you had to work in a kitchen and it, it struck me right away that it was so similar to working on a trading floor and you need to uh, determine what you know you you communication and clear communication is is very important direct communication you don't have a lot of time to worry about how you phrase things you really just need to get mm -hmm. to the point so I, I I know my communication style takes a, a lot of that and it's probably from working on a trading floor for so long. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't become personal, you know, it, it just you see that you just need to solve problems as they come up and, and you see that in, in crisis a lot. And it's also, you know, it, it's accountability is certainly important, but placing blame, there's just no time for it. <laughs> because if you don't solve a problem right away, it's going to get worse because it just starts to compound. Yeah, and it just grows and it gets so much bigger. And that's how it is in, in, on, in markets and trading on the trading floor. And that's how it is in the kitchen. And I, you know, I definitely have taken a lot of that sentiment into just how I manage teams and how we, we think about it. It's like, just get, let's be direct. Let's share our feedback. You have less risk of things getting lost in translation if you aren't too direct about it. And while accountability is critical, we, it's not about placing blame. It's about learning from our mistakes so we can move on and, and, and learn from that together because we are one team and you are only as successful as the team. It doesn't matter if the line cook at the grill station has a good night, if the customer has a bad experience, if anybody falls down. So we're all in it together. Yeah. So thinking about, thinking about the team and thinking about moving forward, what are some of the things that you see as you know, both challenges and opportunities for the exchanges we you know, it, it, just looking to the end of 2020, because I don't know who can project out further than that, but for say the next six months, what are some of the big things that you see that you'd like to, that, you, that you'd that you like to see the, the, the exchange do and where you'd like to see the exchange be? Yeah, you know, I think I, some of these things actually are intertwined and the challenges and opportunities 
can uh, the opportunities can be a challenge if they're not handled right you know very often a challenge is 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 a uh, is an opportunity so there there are a couple things there one is how do you tell your story and how do you one thing I, I've said to my team a lot is no Mad Libs. If you leave blanks in the stories, people write crazy stories. And so you need to actually tell your own story because it, it is so much harder to rewrite a story that has been told already than telling your own. And I mean, we talk about the, our uh, NYC's position as a technology company, as a technology uh, home to technology companies or home to biotech. Because people, because we didn't allow for those companies before, people think of us as not the, the where technology companies list. 75% of technology proceeds have been raised at the NYC, but yet you might some, find somebody who says, well, all the tech companies go to NASDAQ, and that's just not true, right? So telling that story is, is really important. This experience of the first half of the year gives us a lot of uh, information and data to go out and show that, hey, this is why it matters. This is, this is why the floor matters. This is why we invest in it. So that is an opportunity. What I'm most excited about when I look at the next uh, several several months and, and year or two is the innovation we're seeing in the capital markets. And it's it's we haven't seen this much change in, in several several decades. But issuers and investors are looking for new choices and we've been working with them on it. So I, I don't know how closely anyone followed any of this, but when Spotify chose to go public, they wanted to be a public company but they actually didn't need to raise money. Uh, so they didn't wanna go through the traditional IPO process because they felt like, why do I have to raise money just to become a public company? So they came to us and pitched this idea to us and we worked on it with them and with the SEC and their lawyers for a year and a half. And we got the concept of a direct listing coming it, it launched. And they were the first company to choose that path to the public markets where they could just start trading one day as a public company and, and use the, the market maker on the floor to actually set the price instead of having their investment bankers set the price the, the night before. And, and the investment banks were, were supportive uh, and, and working through this with them. They're still, still part of that offering. We've since, we just two weeks ago filed with the SEC to build on that product and allow for a capital raise with it. Because what if they do want to raise money at the same time, but they still want it to be democratized and direct listings really offer the same level of access to all investors. You know, typically you wouldn't mm -hmm. get that opportunity. It's institutions that get allocated shares with, by the investment banks. And in a direct listing, everybody gets it. It's a real democratization of access of information and it lets the market set the price. So that's been a really fun project to work on over the past couple of years. And we keep building on that innovation. And, and there are other companies that are looking to, to, come, out, to come out to the markets using, using those tools and thinking about what problems are we trying to solve and, and how do we want to do this. The other area where we're seeing a lot of companies, and we certainly saw this uh, so far in 2020, is companies using what's known as a special purpose acquisition corporation yeah. for public, so SPACs. And that's where a management team IPOs without a business to run yet. And they are going to go out and acquire a business and they have two years to do it or roughly two years. And they have they, uh, and investors that invested in their IPO if they don't like the business that the, the company identified to acquire, they, would, they can get their money back uh, at, at the end of that period of time. But once that business combination happens, the company's public. So it's an yep. easier way to go public. And, and so we're seeing a lot of companies leverage those things. And those, the SPACs that have come to market this year are really large. And I think that's reflective of the pandemic and what we've seen where a lot of businesses are saying they're going to be opportunistic buys out there where there are good companies that, that we can bring to the public market and it's a good time to do it. And so, you know, we saw that be a very active part of the capital markets in the first half of 2020. And of course, biotech. I mean, I, you, you think about the role biotech is playing right now on the, on the global stage. Mm -hmm. And this is really critical to how we're going to protect ourselves going forward. And, and the, the, the work of, of, the, of the healthcare industry broadly throughout the, throughout the pandemic has, has really been laudable. I mean, we're seeing uh, unparalleled uh, innovation in how we can find solutions to to the to the challenges we're facing. Yeah, I mean we've we've said this before, and we've we've talked about it in a few different episodes on the show. But you know the response from the biotech industry to, to COVID has been amazing, and it really nothing short of game changing yes. with the speed that they're getting things into the clinic, the way that they put the, the from going from 
discovery to having a molecule in the clinic as fast as it has been done without cutting corners, yeah. right? This isn't, you know, you know, Regeneron does not put antibodies into the clinic that it created yesterday without testing them, right? These are, these are all processes that moved incredibly fast, uh, you know, and the vaccine makers, you know, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, you know, any of the ones that we've seen with, with Operation Warp Speed, uh, you know, these things all take amazing amounts of machinery to put together. And, you know, it's, it's been a very good time to be people that are involved in the biotech industry, at least in terms of knowing that the people that you're working with and around uh, are all trying to do the best things to make sure that everybody can get back on their feet. Uh, you know, we've, we've said before that it may not have, we, we may not have exactly the public recognition that we want, but, you know, it is absolutely something to see the way that, that the industry has responded here. Um, I mean, there's know, a you, lot of pride. There should be a lot yeah. of pride in the industry. I, I look at it and I'm literally amazed by what I, I'm seeing. And, and it's, it's inspirational. You know, I, you feel proud as as uh for the country you know and for for others that that people are are diving in finding solutions and those practices that have been amplified and and move are happening so quickly are are things we're going to take away from it right i mean they're going to mm -hmm. change the industry going forward and and not not everything will be a crisis but will be certain certainly things that we learn during the crisis that we apply in everyday life going forward yeah. so i think it'll be really change uh change, change the landscape dramatically that's true. We can we can hope that there aren't any more global pandemics. However, I don't think we're running out of diseases to treat just yet. Right. And you know, one of the nice parts about I don't know if this is a nice part about being in the healthcare industry, but you certainly you're never short for motivation, right? There's always a there's always there are always groups of patients somewhere that that need you, and and that's really the important thing. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, it's it's interesting. You had mentioned you had mentioned direct listings and you had mentioned stacks, and we we thought about both of those things in terms of biotech companies over the past however long. Stacks have actually been a tool that biotech has used uh, in the past, certainly because you usually have it's usually basically how can we find a, a good asset that we want to put money around to bring forward, and because capital and because biotech is such a capital intensive industry, these are things where. You know, if you can put capital around a good a good asset, there's a really great return on that invested investment. Uh, and when we think about things like direct listings, you know, for a long time, people have worried about companies leaving money on the table with an IPO, right? You know, how do we, how do they actually price it effectively? How do they actually get uh, the value out of that offering that you know would instead go to go to the bankers or, or other profit takers immediately? Um, so actually, democratizing that is important because now you have I think the, the, the private funding markets have changed quite a lot. You have much, much larger amounts of private funding that's going into biotech, that's going into tech. And I think that probably fundamentally changes really how people think about how strong a company is. So to go back to what you said before about changing your listing requirements, uh, it's not the same private capital markets as they were you know, 10, even 20, 10, 20 years ago. It's not even close. Yeah, it's it's not close at all, and and companies have stayed private much longer. They're much larger corporations, and across the board, across sectors, you're just seeing you you know we've seen that trend. It's frankly a very concerning trend for me, not just because I run the New York Stock Exchange, but because one of the things that has made the the growth of the capital markets in the U.S. so uh, impactful to to everyday people is that they got to share in it. And so when mm -hmm. when companies stay private and they do their that you know dramatic growth cycles in the private markets only available to a few and then come public when they're more mature companies and the growth is not as, as dramatic. It means that we're contributing to that bifurcation of wealth that, that, you know, continues to, you know, it continues to exacerbate that a bit. And so I do think it's important for companies to, to have a lot of their success in the public markets because that's what's really made this shared success story. And yes, you can, you can dream and have an idea and become a founder and you can come to the public markets and you can raise money and, and you can become very, very wealthy, but you share it and you share it with everybody else because you're doing it in the public markets and you see that that happening less so. And frankly, companies develop bad habits in the private markets because the, the public markets require a lot of discipline and a lot of governance. And so mm -hmm. when big companies have bad habits, it has a, a broader impact on their employees and, and others that they're influencing throughout. So you, know, you, you lose a, a little bit of that. And their valuations in the private markets are not based on a lot of buyers and sellers coming together. 
you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So sometimes they're just crazy. <laughs> you know, it might be one person's view and, and, and not even a straightforward view. I mean, there are some certainly high profile examples of, of you know, they, there, there's a bit of a trend of these top off rounds where somebody who's an early investor in a company then comes in at the very end at a much higher valuation for a very small investment. And all of a sudden this company is valued at this high price point where they just revalued everything else they own in the company that they've owned for a long time. So they're, they're might be okay taking a, a price that isn't as good. And then the public market is left with cleaning that up because yep. the public market will price a company based on transparent information and, and many buyers and sellers. And direct listings really address that, right? So now you bring the company out to the, to the public and you get a lot of price discovery happening with buyers and sellers coming together. What's interesting about Spotify was the, was the first direct listing and Slack was the second direct listing. And mm -hmm. people didn't know Slack before, many people do now in this, in this work from home uh, era. But, but Slack was, both of those companies were the lar two of the largest opening trades in all US capital markets of all time. And they're not the largest companies, but because they were opening and determining their first public price on the exchange, they attracted massive interest. And, and, and it, was, it was really surprising to see how many people were getting involved in that and those opening prints. And then they stayed, they were very successful pricings where they, they didn't have this first day pop, which you know, people would see a first day pop in an IPO and think, wow, that was a great IPO. It's up 100%. Well, it wasn't great if you're the one who sold it the night before. <laughs> so exactly. Right. If you're an investor of the company and, and you're trying to bring your company public and, and you get ripped off, that doesn't feel so good. Yeah. Right. You, Invariably, you would, see, you would see some of the posts with the great first day pop, and then you would see another post that calculated exactly how much money the company left on the table from that first day pop. Yeah. You see a lot of VCs doing those calculations instantly and sharing yep. them. <laughs> yeah, they're the ones that, that very often are... are uh, not not part of that that pricing and and it, it you know there's a there's a lot that goes into it you see companies because of that trend floating smaller percentages of their of their company so in fairness to the investment banks it is harder to get a price right on a smaller piece of the business mm -hmm. and that's that you know so it, and i don't mean to to paint the the, the banks as as all that here but it, it becomes a, a self fulfilling prophecy that it does get harder to price them when when companies are are selling smaller smaller mm -hmm. pieces also, from what you said before, many times you kind of you when you have this institutional way of doing things, you go back to the things that you know, right? Yeah. And if the majority of people thinks that well, we can we can get this out the door at, at eighteen, and it's important for us to get out the door, it's important for us to be a successful IPO. It goes out at eighteen because it's what everyone thinks that they can do, right. right? You know, a lot of times you don't necessarily. It's very easy from the outside to basically criticize what someone's doing without really totally understanding why it is that that they're doing it. Um, you know, Jennifer, were you going to jump in with something a second ago? It sounded like you were, you were coming question, in. And, and it makes sense to, to pop it in here. Yep. Um, so Stacy, do you think that biotechs um, will find a direct listing attractive or do you think that they'll go the more traditional route? Yeah, I, I definitely think they're, uh, you know, they usually they need capital. So the, the filing that we put in with the SEC does allow for a capital raising. And we have some companies that are looking at that you know, that are considering that. And I, I think that, that that would be more likely, I be, would be more likely to see biotechs use a direct listing once that's approved and we're pending SEC approval, but hope to get that soon. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, we learned already, you know, we had a universe of one with Spotify and we learned a lot about direct listings then. And, and if you asked me after Spotify, which companies are good candidates for a direct listing, I would have said, oh, there are companies that need to have strong brands and and they need to, to have a, uh, a distributed shareholder base so that they, there is liquidity when it, when it trades. Because there was a lot of arguments between people who have been in this industry for a long time about whether or not the, there would be buyers or sellers in a direct listing. You know, people thought they're going to be all buyers and, and no one's selling and vice versa. And so that, that was interesting. After Slack, we realized, oh, well, no, you don't, you don't need to be a household name. And Slack was well known in, in Silicon Valley but not well known across, uh, uh, you know, the same way Spotify was and certainly not consumer at the consumer level yet. And, and they didn't have such a distributed shareholder base, but you need sellers, right? You need liquidity is really what the, the point is. And so knowing that there would be people who will come in and, and sell shares at some point in time and have some liquidity 
that that was important. And you just need to be able to tell your story. I mean, there's a view that uh, you can't do a road show. And one of the counter points that you hear a lot for direct listings is, oh, well, you don't get do a road show. And so you lose that ability to, uh, to, to go out and explain your story to investors. That's not true. You can do a road show. And both Spotify and Slack did do road shows. They also did w uh, investor days that were broadcast out webcast to anyone that wanted to watch them. Again, democratizing access. And that was something that really was important to Daniel Ek, the CEO of Spotify, who said, well, I don't want to just have a handful of people know our story. Everyone should get the same information. So they did, they did a, um, a broadcast investor day that was an all day hear from all the senior members of the team and describe what they were doing. But then they also did a roadshow to go out and talk to the investors they were really hoping to see be in their stock. I think you'll see innovation and, and a bit of an evolution on that front as well. I think you'll see the banks play more of a role in that process. And you know, initially the SEC was hesitant to have the banks building a book for a direct listing, but I think you'll see them provide services to, to companies that you know, they don't have to be on their own. Spotify and Slack did a lot of that work on their own. Mm -hmm. I, I think as, you, as we go forward, you'll see banks providing services to, to, um, to companies that are looking to do a direct listing but want the help. Yeah. You know, one thing that yes. I do think will be imagined is uh, reimagined after coronavirus is the roadshow. Um, I've heard from multiple um, companies and investors that have been doing a, some virtual version of it, right? Yes. <laughs> um, and, and it seems it seems to work. So I, I think that people will not be flying around the country um, for several weeks on end um, in yes. the future. They can do some of it virtually. Yeah, I think they'll do a mix. I think that you know the, the, they'll go to the cities where they're going to see a lot of people and they want to do that in person. I, I spoke to w one of the CEOs that was working on an IPO through the pandemic and, and was going public. And I, I said to him, like, well, yeah, we're winding down your roadshow and, and you're not going to be as exhausted. I usually I'm welcoming CEOs to the New York Stock Exchange and they're running on adrenaline. You know, they're super excited, but, but they're exhausted because they've just been on a plane for the past two weeks. And he said, oh no, I'm exhausted. He goes, I go from one call, like you fit in twice as many meetings yeah. as you would do yeah. because you could literally, he's like, I disconnect the call and I'm on the next one. And he's like, it's just a different kind of energy usage. Uh, yeah. But, so I think you'll see a combination. Yeah, when you, when you emerge from the back-to-back -back Zoom calls for the entire day, you're basically a shell of yourself. You may not be in an airport, but you're kind of wandering around and just basically <laughs> yes. shattered. You know, it, I, I like the fact that you bring up storytelling so much because I think from the biotech perspective, everyone's kind of had to do that in a lot of different ways because you're you're talking about you're talking about science that people are inevitably going to dig into. They want to know how you got there. They want to know why it's different. And this these are things that, you know, biotech investors have long memories too. They remember why drugs fail. They remember they remember seeing phase two data that looked the same as your phase two data. And why are you any different? Right. And we think about that a lot now. It's one of the reasons we were excited to start the uh, Emerging Company Showcase with you guys last year, because we wanted to find a way to take uh, New York area companies and exciting biotech companies and give them a new platform to tell their story where, you know, they were private. They didn't tend to have this kind of forum before. And that worked really well. So we were super excited to have you as a partner that went unbelievably well and everyone's now asking us how we can uh, how we can do it again as successfully this year but okay. that's one of the I things think, that we oh. took away when I, you know when i talked about when we looked at our business and we said what are we where what are we not doing that we should be doing we have this community of companies but we weren't leveraging it quite the way we could and which is why we we renovated the building that we have and we had this this floor or two floors really that were massive floors with giant offices for the executive team at, at the New York Stock Exchange and spaces for the trading floor uh, members to go up and, and eat, eat. And we kicked ourselves out of those spaces and turned them all into a community space for listed companies to come in and for us to hold events there so that they actually get the benefit of being part of this community and learning from each other. And you know, when you, when you list on the New York Stock Exchange, you're, you're, you're part now of our family and, and we use that. And so holding events to be able to say, what, wh how do I find my mentors or my partners or customers? You know, how, do, how do we forge those relationships? A lot of that is, is through bringing people together in the space and content generation and telling their stories. So we, we rolled out a whole number of platforms that whether they're podcasts that allow for uh, CEO to, to come on and, and tell the story of their business and 
we would we would record all of those pre-COVID in the library of the New York Stock Exchange. And we just have so many interesting people that would come through the building, whether they were there to see us or or speaking on CNBC and uh, you know, with 35 media outlets downstairs. So so they would come in and 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 do the podcast and tell their stories, which were fun and and we have a number of different ways that we'll get that content out there because that's such an important part of running your business is actually as you're looking to attract investors, customers, and others, having them understand the value that you're looking to provide and where, where you're going to go from here. Yeah. Our, I imagine that those platforms are some of the things in your toolbox now for when you know either biotech companies or other kind of companies are thinking about where they can list. You can actually say, look, this is what we have. These are the platforms that we can, uh, that we can give to you because... I agree with you. I think going forward that there's, I think the in-person thing is going to come back, but I think now I think the level of digital engagement is going to be much, much higher. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and those, those are accessible, whether, whether, whether you're in a position where you want to have content be available for others to see, or you want to be the beneficiary of content. I mean, one of the things that we did over, aside from the Scott Gottlieb calls and other, other, other things where we had, a lot of CEOs of tech companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange who were sort of one-off handling questions from businesses that were suddenly running remote workforces. Right. And so we held a digital leader summit to say, okay, well, you can go out and talk about how your cloud storage, you know, Box, the Aaron Levy's the CEO of Box, Jennifer Tejada runs PagerDuty, Stuart Butterfield runs Slack. And, and they talked about the services and what it means to have a digital transformation. And I mean, that's been accelerated uh, dramatically over the past, you know, I can't, I can't even count the number of hours that will be saved from businesses who would have been fighting over whether or not it was possible to have people effectively work remotely. Yes. Because I think that, you know, I talked to CEOs across, across the board at different levels, different size companies, and, and they've all said the same thing. You know, I mean, I, I had a conversation with Tim Cook, and he said he couldn't believe how, how well they were, uh, their, their development team seem to thrive in, in being fully remote. And we've had the same experience. I, I have those conversations across the board. I think we, if we can share that information, share that knowledge and, and you know, help, help people be better public companies is really our goal because our success is driven by their success. And so we just view it in, in a way that, tell us what your problem is, tell us what you're trying to solve and we'll see if we can tap into our network. You know, one other way we've been doing that recently is diversity. And one of the issues uh, that, you know, certainly organizations tend to have better diversity when they have boards that are more diverse and, and are focused on that. Mm -hmm. Most board seats are filled by recommendations and referrals, though, not so much by recruiters. And so we launched a board advisory council a little over a year ago that is 25 CEOs of NYC listed companies and many healthcare, healthcare CEOs are, are on, on that, uh, on, on those, uh, on that board, like, from Merck and Johnson and Johnson and, and, and others. And part of their job as, as a council member is to give us a name of candidates that they would recommend to be on a board. And so you're getting this diverse database of diverse candidates that are vetted, right? And there's somebody who's saying like, hey, I, I, would, I would recommend this person. So then our, our listed company community has access to that database and then they have access to that CEO to call them and say, hey, you recommended this person or I'm interested in having them on my board. Can you give me some color. So you, you it, we're helping the companies build their own networks by leveraging our network so that they actually can get those referrals more, more broadly. And, and we've seen, we, we had our first board member placed uh, prior to, you know, the first half of this year. And, and we've seen a lot of other CEOs uh, coming on now asking like, Hey, can I, can I get access to that database? Where do I log in? Um, one, one question that's come in and we would be remiss. Um, especially given our partnership with um, the NYSE, is um, that it says on the back of unprecedented growth in biotech at large, which kinds of biotech companies should list on the NYSE versus NASDAQ? Yeah, I mean, we can help companies at various, at, at, at different stages. We, we launched a, an on-ramp for smaller companies that are pre-revenue companies so that they could list on the New York Stock Exchange with lower fees. So it gave them the ability to, co to come on and, and, and su support us. I mean, certainly uh, one of the things that people see about us is that our, we tend to have much larger companies on the NYC than NASDAQ, but it doesn't mean that there isn't, uh, you know, we still continue to support all, all, all of the size companies that, that come out there. And so, you know, I, I think we, 
certainly reach out to us. We, we would be happy to, to work and help and use all of the tools that we have to, to help make companies successful. And it, and it comes down to that network, trading stocks better, and as well as getting that visibility and platform out there. Well, we have, we have time for go like ahead, Jennifer, sorry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's fantastic. And I think that, you know, sorry, I just had that thing that happened behind me. Um, I think there's been a number of things that we covered today. That, honestly, it's it's nice to do these things where we learn as much, if not more, than uh, than we than we kind of walked in with. And I think there's probably a lot of pieces of this conversation that uh, many of our audience didn't know. Uh, we're really excited to be working with you again on the Emerging Company Showcase. We're starting to put that stuff together now, and we'll have a really good crop of companies together. Um, one of the things that we're working on, uh, much like you said, we're going to actually do a series beforehand where we do webinars with the CEOs uh, prior to the actual prior to the actual event. So again, we're going to get into some storytelling uh, storytelling before the storytelling, if you will. Um, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. This is this has been a great great hour, and uh, we're we're really glad to have you as a partner. Oh, it's been, been my pleasure. And we're, we're excited by what we're going to see coming out of the biotech industry for the future. I mean, literally, uh, what I love about my job is we help companies raise money so they can go out and change the world. And we're proud of the ro small role that we play in that. But watching companies change the world is so exhilarating. And biotech is literally changing our lives, saving our lives. Well, thank you for engaging in our biotech discussion today. Thanks. Thanks. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye -bye. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.